million dollars. <laughs> I'm sorry, y'all. I can't help it. I enjoy college football. Hallelujah. It's a good thing to have something to enjoy. Amen? Amen. And when your team's winning, you're enjoying it, right? I'll tell you something. Jesus never lost a battle in his life. Even on the cross, he was winning. When he was hanging there saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We didn't realize it at the moment. He didn't realize it at the moment, maybe in his flesh. But he won. He won. Because all hell was swallowed up in the victory of the cross. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 We don't have to worry about it because God has got it in control. Amen. Amen. Well, I'll tell you what. There's an old song that says it's glory, glory. Hallelujah. Let's sing that for a minute. Y'all y'all sing loud last week. And y'all sing loud again this week. We need a choir going on, all right? Y'all sing loud.
Um, Brother Donald, would you come and receive the offer this morning for us? Thank you, Jesus. We worship the Lord in our offering, and we're so grateful that he is so good to us. Everybody say this out loud with me. God is good, and he is so exceptionally good to me. It's absolutely true. Could you say that every day? Remind yourself to say that every day. God is good, and he is so exceptionally good to me. His goodness will get good. It'll get good every day. It'll get good. Amen. Father, we thank you so much for how good you are to us. We thank you that you give us the privilege of bringing all the times into the storehouse and all the offerings. And we do it and not only in obedience to you, but we do it in worship. We worship you in the time. We thank you that you're so good to us. And we thank you that you have promised in your word that if we do that, we're testing you. We're putting you to the test because you promised that you would rebuke the devourer for our sake, that he shall not destroy the fruits of our ground, neither shall our vine cast her fruit before the time of the field. And you promised that you would pour out your blessing over us greater than what we can contain it. So all nations are going to see us and they're going to call us blessed. And they're going to say those people serve the Lord. And we thank you for it in the name of Jesus. And everybody said amen. 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 Go ahead. Hallelujah. Well, the Spirit of the Lord.
body up, and it does me too. It, it wrecks our bodies. It messes with our um, sleep cycle. It messes with the, some people have depression. There's such a thing as uh, the winter blues. It's actually a real thing. And so it, uh, it affects people differently. And so this morning, being the first day of our time change, I said it's a good time to get together and worship the Lord, ain't it? We can kind of start that off on the right foot. Start a bad thing off on the right foot. It's not such a bad thing after all, okay? So God can make it a better thing for us. So, you know, it'd be light in the morning when you go into work, and then it'd be dark when you're coming home if you work a eight or eight-hour job during the day. Now. So, but that's okay. You've got good headlights on your car, you'll be all right. All right. We are still rolling along in our Keys to the Kingdom series, Effective prayer. Effective prayer being a key to the kingdom. And this is the third study in effective prayer. This morning we're looking at heavenly guidance. Heavenly guidance. If you look at your notes, we're going to start with this verse and then we're going to pray. It's there in Ephesians 6 18, printed in the Amplified. It says, pray at all times. Everybody say, all times. all times. On every occasion, in every season. In <coughs> cooperation with. That's something I put in there. Okay, I wrote that in myself. In cooperation with the Spirit. If you break down the terminology in the Spirit, you're actually in cooperation with Him. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're praying in tongues, although that is a good thing to be doing. But you can pray at all times on every occasion and every season in cooperation with the Spirit with what? All manner of prayer. So it doesn't encompass only tongues. It's every kind of prayer. All manner of prayer and entreaty. To that end, keep alert, watch with strong purpose and perseverance. Interceding in behalf of all the saints, God's consecrated people. Now, Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you that you have blessed us to be able to come together and break bread among the brothers and sisters. We thank you for all that you've done for us, and we now, we trust in you that your anointing is flowing through us, but we're asking you that your anointing flow into all the hearers. Lord, we pray you'll make us to have ears to hear and eyes to see, your ears to hear, your eyes to see as you hear and see. Help us to look through your eyes and hear through your ears to understand with your anointed mind and your comprehensive heart. And we receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation in our hearts flowing in us, enlightening the eyes of our understanding so that we can comprehend with all saints what you want us to do. We comprehend your will, we comprehend your ways, and we can walk in your righteousness, and we thank you for it. And everybody said amen. amen. And amen. Next scripture is 1 John 5, 14 through 15, printed in the Amplified. And this is the confidence. Everybody say confidence. Amen. It's a confidence, the assurance, the privilege of boldness, which we have in him, him being Christ. We are sure. Everybody say, I am sure. I am sure. If we ask anything, Make any request according to his will in agreement with his own plan. He listens to and hears us. Now, I want you to learn how to read the word in first person. Because if you learn how to read the word in first person, the word comes alive in your heart. I want you to leave this. Start at verse 14. And I want you to pay attention to the way I read it. This is the confidence the assurance, the privilege, the boldness which I have in him. I am sure that if I ask anything, make any request according to his will, in agreement with his plan, he listens to and hears me. Amen? Amen. Read it in first person. Make it yours. Because God's word is his will for your life. For my life. It's his word speaking to you. He's speaking to you. He's talking to you as his son, as his daughter. So you can confidently read that and say, this is the confidence I have. I am 
sure if I ask anything according to his will in agreement with his plan, he listens to me, he hears me, and since I positively know he listens to me and whatever I ask, I also know with settled and absolute knowledge that I have granted to me as my present possession the request I made of him. God taught me how to read the word in first person, and it revolutionized my prayer life. Because I take that to him in the throne room, and I come boldly before the throne of grace and say, Abba, Father, you said. You said, sir. Amen. And I want you to know he loves it when we do that. He gets so joyful and excited when we are bold enough to have the confidence that his word is true and it's true for me. A lot of people believe his word is true, but they're not sure it's true for yourself because you're still worried about the things you did in the past. And it don't even exist anymore. You're worried about something that's not even there anymore. Because right. the blood of Jesus has cleansed you from it and it's gone. Amen. Ask God about Esau. I don't know what you're talking about. Amen? Yeah. So we've got to have the boldness and confidence to take his word and just do what he says to it. Amen? Look at the next line. The next heading is the word is the truth and the truth is the light. Excuse me, the word is the truth and the truth is the light. Psalms 119, 105 in the New Living Translation says, Your word is a lamp to what? Guide. Say guide. guide. To God. Your word is a lamp to guide my feet and a light for my path. 2 Corinthians 4, 7. 6 through 7, Amplified. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shone in our hearts. So as to beam forth the light of the illumination, for the illumination, excuse me, of the knowledge of the majesty and glory of God. As it is manifest in the person and is revealed in the face of Jesus Christ the Messiah. However, we possess this precious treasure the divine light of the gospel in frail human vessels of earth. That the grandeur and exceeding greatness of the power may be shown to be from who? God. Ah, from God. And not from ourselves. God did it this way on purpose so that his glory shines through us, but it doesn't give us the big head because we're not the ones to do it. Amen? Because we can't. Without God, it's impossible for us to do anything. Jesus said in John 15, he said, I'm the vine, you're the branch. He said, apart from me, you can do what? Nothing. Say it again. Nothing. Nothing fruitful is what's involved. You're not fruitful. A branch disconnected from the vine is, it is dead, and it will not produce fruit. Amen? Yeah. And he called us to produce fruit. Now let's look. Look at the bottom of the page. First John 1, 5 through 7. And this is the message, the message of promise, which we have heard from him and now reporting to you. Everybody read it out loud. God is light, and there is no darkness in him at all. No, not in way. There's no darkness in God at all. The insurance companies blame every bad thing that happens on you and your property as a what? Say it again. An act of God. And they're absolutely wrong. God didn't make that happen to you. He didn't make that happen to your property. If that was an act of God, then the storm that was trying to kill Jesus and his disciples, Jesus would not have had the right to stand up and rebuke. Yeah. Amen. Amen? But he rebuked the storm and it obeyed him. Why? Because it wasn't an act of God. It was an act of Satan that was coming through the demon act in Galilee. They were going to him because Jesus had an assignment from the Father to cast the devils out of him. Legion. Thousands of them. That was his nickname. And those demons were tired, trying their best to keep Jesus from getting to the shore where the demon act was. They didn't want to be cast out. They didn't want Jesus on their shore, so they come up with a storm. What does Paul the Apostle tell us? The Satan is the prince of the power of what? The air. In Ephesians chapter 6, he tells us, in starting in verse 10, he says that we wrestle against flesh and blood, 
And he says that we are wrestling against principles, or we're not wrestling against flesh and blood, excuse me, we're wrestling against principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, and spiritual wickedness in what? Heavenly places, the atmosphere. So we've got to understand that God don't cause these, quote, acts of God. It ain't the God of heaven, it's the God of the world. Amen? I could preach all day and tell you about the, the insanity of, of climate change and global warming. They made a religion out of it. So they can... Yeah. Anything you want to know, did you have a question about? Follow the money truck. It's always going to be about money. Get to the bottom of it. You'll find it. It's money. All right. Are y'all okay this morning? Amen. Y'all okay if I tell you the truth, right? Amen. Right? Now, verse 6 at the top of the page, page 2, top of the page, verse 6 starts with so. So if we are partakers together and enjoy fellowship with him, when we live and move and are walking about in darkness, we are both speaking falsely and do not live and practice the truth which the gospel presents. But if we really are living and walking in the light, as he himself is in the light, we have true unbroken fellowship with one another, including Christ. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses or removes us from all sin and guilt and keeps us cleansed from all sin in all its forms and manifestations. You don't have to be tormented by your past. Because if the devil can keep reminding you of it and reminding you of how bad of a sinner you were and all the mistakes you made this week, when you come to God boldly before the throne, it's going to affect your belief in what God said about you can come and you can bring his word and he's going to give it to you. Because it will affect your faith. That's why in, the, in the, the New Testament you find so many places where God said, I have wiped away your past. Amen? Yeah. Look at the next heading. Jesus the Christ lived his life in the guidance of the light of the truth. Now let's look at that. Turn to John, St. John, chapter 8. St. John, chapter 8. Father. 
Verse 28. So Jesus said, when you've lifted up the Son of Man on the cross, then you will understand that I am He. If you look in the King James, you'll see the word He in that verse is in italics. That means the King James scholars inserted it on their own. It's not in the original manuscript. Jesus said, I am the I am. So verse 28, we're going to read it again. When you've lifted up the Son of Man on the cross, you will understand that I am. I do nothing on my own, but I say only what the Father, what? Taught me. Now this is what we've got to understand. Jesus is the I am. He's here to, at this time, at this point in time. He's talking to them face to face in the flesh. He has a, a body of flesh on him because the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. So the I am has come in the flesh. And he's speaking to them. And they're talking and conversing. And what he says is, I am the I am, but I only do, I, all, I do nothing on my own, but I say what the Father has taught me. Up in 27, uh, 25, he said, for I say only what I've heard from the one who sent me, and he is completely truthful. Now look at verse 29. The one who sent me is with me. He has not deserted me, for I always do what pleases him. Now, this is what's interesting about Jesus' ministry. Jesus lived in the guidance of the light of the truth. He said that he didn't say anything on his own, even though he was the word in the flesh. He had the right. If anybody had the right to say something on their own, it would have been him, because he was the word in the flesh. Why did he come in the flesh? To give us the example of how we are to live once he goes to heaven. Yeah. Everybody understand this? Yeah. So if you read the four Gospels, Jesus ended the Gospels by telling the disciples, go and do what I did. He even explained to them in John 14, 15, and 16, the works that I do, you're going to do. And even greater works. Now religion tells us today, well, we can't do it. We're, we're, if you're in the church, you're already doing it. Because Jesus was one man having one service at a time. How many church services do you think are going on right now? Million. The church is already doing more than what he did. Physically. Okay? So we get tripped up in our religious way of thinking. But what Jesus wanted us to understand is, how are we going to live? How are we going to prosper? How are we going to walk and do the things that he did? He gave us the example. He said, I'm only doing what I hear my father say. I only say what I hear my father say. I only do what he's taught me to do. He spent time with the father, and the father showed him what he's to do, and he just did it. Amen? Amen. And when he encountered anything, basically, he already knew what was going to happen because he had spent time with the father. It wasn't because he was omnipresent, because he wasn't because he was in a human body. And he could only be one place at one time and only know what the Father showed him to know. He limited himself. Well, how do we know that? Look at your, uh, look at your notes. Go down to where it says verses 26 through 29. Jesus was the Word in the flesh having a human experience on earth. He had no advantage and he was not exempt from any part of the human life, trials, and troubles we also experience. He was only able to do all that he did through a highly disciplined prayer life. He was totally surrendered to and dependent upon the guidance of Ruach Emet, which is the Hebrew of spirit truth. We call it Holy Spirit. The Hebrew name is Ruach Emet. Philippians 2, 5 through 8, explains this to us. He says, let the same attitude and purpose and humble mind be in you which was in Christ. Let him be your example of humility, in humility. Who, although being essentially one with God. Everybody say one with God. One with God. He was God. And in the form of God, possessing the fullness of the attributes which make God God, did not think this equality with God 
as a thing to be eagerly grasped or retained. Verse 7. But he what? Say it again. He stripped himself of all privileges and rightful dignity so as to assume the guise of a servant, a slave, in that he became like who? Like us. Human beings. And was born a human being. Verse 8. And after that he appeared in human form. He abased and humbled himself still further and carried his obedience to the extreme of death, even the death of the cross. Jesus did not have a godly advantage in himself because he was God. He shed all of his advantage, all of his deity, everything, and was born as a human being just like us. I want to give it to you in a different way. Jesus actually confined himself into flesh. And he obeyed all the rules of fleshly living. Yeah. Can everybody understand that? Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? He walked as a man, even though he was God. He bound himself to the laws of physics and living a human life on the earth, even though he created the whole thing. He did it on purpose so that he could walk among us and touch us and be one of us and experience everything we're experiencing and show us how to overcome it all. And the way he did it was he had a deep relationship with his heavenly father and he followed the heavenly God in everything he did. The Holy Spirit was upon him. He was anointed of the Holy Spirit. Remember when he was baptized, he come up, the Holy Spirit came down like a dove and settled him and he was baptized by the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit led him immediately where? Into the wilderness. As soon as the Holy Spirit led on him and he was baptized in the Spirit, immediately the guidance of the Holy Spirit began to show him what he needed to do. And he went the way into the wilderness. Bible readers, you understand that story. You read it. Everybody with me? So Jesus didn't do anything the Holy Spirit didn't lead him to do. When he came to the well of the, of, of the woman at the well of Samaria, he told his disciples, I, the King James says this, I must needs go to Samaria. That's the way the King James does it. Why? Because he had an assignment. The Holy Spirit had showed him there's a woman coming at this time. You need to be there then. He had an assignment. I mean, you know, timing is everything. Yeah. Okay? If God tells you to do something, and you lollygag around and say, well, I'll do it tomorrow, well, guess what? The amount of effort that God made to make the other people that's involved in doing what they needed to do for you to be at that point for God to get to you what he needed to get to you has already been started. If you lolly, if you lollygag around and say, well, I'll do it tomorrow, guess what's going to happen? You're going to miss it. And God's not obligated to rearrange their schedules. We miss so much because uh, we let our flesh get in the way. Because we don't follow the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Yeah. Are y'all still okay? Yeah. Are you still with me? Mm -hmm. All right, let's go on. It says in your notes, verse 32. Let's look at verse 32. Let's look at verse, verse 31 so, so it can lead into verse 32. I'm going to read it out of the King James. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my what? Excuse me. If you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed. The New Living says, if you are truly my disciples, if you remain faithful to my teachings. Verse 32 of the King James. Read it out loud with me. Everybody ready? Read. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall what? Read it again. You said it like that because you heard other people quote it wrong. Yeah. Read it again. Out loud. Ready to read. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall what? Free. Say, make you free. Make you free. Make you free. Now, here's the difference between set free and made free. You're walking along in the woods. You're walking down this path, and snap, you step into a bear trap. And you're hollering, help, help, help. And finally, somebody comes, they hear you, they come. They help you out of that trap. Bind up your legs. You have been set free. Have you not? Mm -hmm. That's being set free. Now that 
couple of bears, and I set out all these traps. But I made a map. I'm going to give you a copy of the map. As a matter of fact, I'm going to do better than that. I'm going to give you a copy of the map, and I'm going to go with you, and I'm going to guide you to the end of these woods. Guess what's just happened? You've been made for it. You've been made for it. Because he who the Son, look at verse 36. If the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be what? Free indeed. Because if you're just set free, you go along on your own and you step into another trap. Then you've got to be set free again. This is how we learn to teach, celebrate, recover, and celebrate freedom at Free Chapel. God, help me to understand the scripture and say, son, you've got to help them to understand. You can be set free over and over and over again. But once you get a hold of the Holy Spirit guide who gives you the word and understanding of the word, you'll never step in that trap again. Amen. You're now made free. You can go from recovering to free. Amen? Amen? You won't have to be recovering all your life. Now you are free. You're no longer an addict. That was in the past. Now you're free. Why? Because the Son of God has made you free. Because now He's guiding you with the Word. And you're going along with the Word, and the Holy Spirit's with you, and He's going, oop, oop, oop. And He kind of nerds and nudges you over, and there's a trap. There's a prayer trap. And you and him are walking along, whoa, whoa, wait, take two steps to the right. Okay, all right, now let's go. There's another one. You'll never step in another one again as long as you follow what? The map and the urges of the Holy Spirit. And I use the word urge on purpose. Because most of the time, he guides us through urges. He'll guide us. It's not as much a feeling as you get. You ever felt unsettled right here? Yeah. Anybody know what I'm talking about? It wasn't here. You feel unsettled up right here just watching TV. But I'm talking about right here. Right here, it's, it's, it doesn't feel right. I don't have peace. When the peace is removed from your heart, stop. Don't do that. Don't go there. Change your plans. I've been understanding that? Because the Holy Spirit will guide you through peace. If the peace of your heart's not there, then don't go. Don't do whatever. Okay, let the peace of the Holy Spirit guide you. That's the urges of the Holy Spirit. He's guiding you. No peace, don't do it. Everybody say it with me. No peace, no peace. don't do it. No do it. All right. Now, we've covered up down to the, up down. Well, that's kind of funny. We've covered down to the Holy Spirit, the next line, the next heading, the Holy Spirit. Ruach, the Spirit of Truth, is our heavenly guide on earth. So let's go to John 16. We're still in St. John. Turn to 16. Everybody still okay? Yeah. All right. Anybody have any trouble getting here today? Because the devil did not want you to come to this service. No good. Why? Because you get the truth. Once you get the truth, you'll know how to pray. Once you know how to pray, the devil, his hands are tied. Because if you know how to pray, whatever you bind on earth will be, whatever you loose on earth will be, and Satan ain't got no power over it. Amen? Okay. Are you glad you're here? John 16, starting at verse 7, let's read in King James. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come to you. Comforter is the Holy Spirit, Spirit of truth. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Now let's flip over to the new living. He said when he comes, verse 8, new living. When he comes, he will convict the world of its sin and of God's righteousness, and of the coming judgment. The world's sin is that it refuses to believe in me. Jesus is talking. Righteousness is available because I go to the Father, and you will see me no more. Verse 11. Judgment will come because the ruler of this world has already been judged. I'm going to stop right there just for a moment. 
Because the Holy Spirit wants us to understand. Go back to the top of verse 8. And when he, the Holy Spirit, comes, the Spirit of truth comes, he will what? Say that word. Convict. I'm going to tell you this. You will never talk somebody into getting saved. Ain't going to happen. You ever been in a service where somebody, you got, a, you got a preacher, and he's trying to talk somebody into coming to the altar and get saved? Makes you want to crawl on the bench. And they're very well meaning, okay? But if the Holy Spirit isn't convicting that person, you're not going to talk them into it. They might come just to get you to shut up. Okay? But you're never going to talk somebody and get the same. Have you ever had anybody talk to you to do anything that you truly don't want to do? I dare you. It ain't going to happen. If I don't want to do it, I ain't going to do it. Amen? Amen? That's just the way we are. Well, what happens is the Holy Spirit has the power of conviction. So what do we do then? We pray. Because the Holy Spirit will convict upon your prayers. If you know a person, the Holy Spirit's put in your mind that needs to be saved, and that person has not come, and that person's not listening, then what do you do? Holy Spirit, convict them. Convict them. Convict them and get them right with God. And He will. He'll begin to convict them. They'll lose sleep. They'll start thinking thoughts about God. I don't even know why. They'll be turning the TV, and every show they turn to, somebody's going to say something about God. The Holy Spirit conviction is way stronger than our badgering. Amen? You'll never nag somebody to heaven. Ain't going to happen. Amen? That's why I'm very, very short about all the cross. Because if they don't come, I'll leave it with the Holy Spirit. I ain't going to drag you off. That's up to him. You want to go to hell? That's your choice. I'm tough, ain't I? Okay? But that's just the way it is. I'm like God. If God, God's not going to drag you to heaven. He's not going to do it. you got to choose it. The only way you're going to choose it is if the Holy Spirit gives you conviction. Amen? Yeah. Everybody good? Yeah. It's the truth. All right. Verse 12. New Living, verse 12. There's so much more I want to tell you, but you can't bear it now. Verse 13. When the Spirit of what? Truth. Say it again. Truth. The Spirit of truth is come. He will what? Guide you into what? All truth. He will not speak on his own word. Or excuse me, on his own. But he will tell you what he has heard. Now I want to go back to King James. Verse 13 in King James. Howbeit when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. All truth. It says all truth in both one of them. In, in, in both um, King James and New Living. All truth. The Holy Spirit is here to guide you in all truth. Now, I want you to take your notes. Go back to page one. Look at page one. Second verse, uh, excuse me, second scripture down. This is the confidence, the assurance, the privilege, and boldness that we have in Him. We are sure if we ask anything, make any request according to what? His will. Say it again. His will. His will. In agreement with His own plan. Well, how do we know what that is? How can we possibly know the will of God? How do we know where to find it? The Holy Spirit. Because he's the spirit of what? Truth. And he will lead us into what? All truth. The truth of the word is God's will for your life. It's found in the word. The Holy Spirit, his job, his call, his anointing is to guide you in the word to the will of God for your life. Does everybody get this? See, that's why God said through Paul, study to show yourself approved. Not approved of people, but approved of God. When you come before God with the wrong thing, making your requests known, if you don't know the will of God for your life, he can't help you. The only thing he can do is, help the Holy, is get the Holy Spirit to try to help you find the will of God. Because he can't give it to you if it's not in the covenant. That's why so many times our prayers go unanswered and unanswered and unanswered. Because we haven't went to the Word to find God's will. 
Is this something I should even ask for? Am I ready for this? Is the timing right in my life? People say, I'm waiting on God. No, you ain't. You ain't waiting on you. Maybe it's God's will, but you got to grow into it. Amen? Amen. Ma'am? Maybe it's not God's will. Maybe it's God's will, but you're not, you've got to grow into it. You have to grow into his will for your life because you're not ready. Rang a bell, didn't it? Now, I have no idea what she's going to do, but the Holy Spirit gave her revelation. Because I've asked God, let me, let me show you something. If I, I'll just say this. My dad, because we lived in an area where we could, he taught me how to drive his old truck when I was around 10 or 11 years old. I could reach the pedal there, okay? And so I'm not out on the road to hurt somebody, but in our driveway, I could drive. And I was tall enough, and he gave me the ins and outs, and I could get it started, I could move it from one point to another. Now I'm learning how to drive. Not one time did he throw the keys after he taught me how to drive in the driveway. He never threw the keys when I was 10 or 11 years old and say, drive to town and get me some uh, milk and bread. Why? I knew how to drive. I could reach the pedals. Why could he not give me the keys and turn me loose with the truck out in public traffic? Say it again. Why was I not ready? And and experience and immaturity. There's a maturity we forget about in our spiritual life. As we grow in our life, let me, let me just tell you this. Growth in your body happens as you feed it, correct? If you don't feed your body the right diet, you can stunt your growth, amen? Yes. So if you feed your body the right diet, don't you think your spirit needs the right diet? If you feed your spirit the right diet, your spirit grows. But as you go through life, you also mature. Maturity happens as a physical, mental, and emotional process, but it also happens as a spiritual process. Paul the Apostle talks about it. And we grow and we mature in the Lord. As we live in the Lord, as we walk in the Lord, as we experience God, our maturity level grows. And the more we mature, the more he will give us greater responsibility. Because the blessing could be a curse if you're not ready for it. Do you understand that? The blessing could be a curse if you're not ready for it. Because if Dad blessed me with the keys and say, hey, I know you want to. You go ahead and go to the store. You know, it's only eight or nine miles away. Watch all the traffic. You'll be fine. And I'm only 10 years old. That'd be a curse. Do you understand that? Even though I thought it might be a blessing, it'd be a curse. Now, I'm going to hurt somebody. Could kill somebody. Amen. Until we're ready, the things we're praying for, God can't give it to us until we're mature enough to handle it. Because right. he's a what? Good father. Amen? Yes. And a good father's not going to do that to their kid. So a lot of times we're blaming it on God when it's us. We've got to grow into it. So what do we do? Holy Spirit, help me grow. Give me the word. Help me, guide me, help me to grow, help me to mature. Everybody with me? Okay. They help you? Okay. Good. Now, look at this. Look at your notes. John 16, 13 through 14, Amplified. But when he, the spirit of truth, the truth giving spirit comes, he will guide you into all the truth, the whole truth, the full truth. For he will not speak his own message on his own authority. But he will tell whatever he hears from the Father. He will give the message that has been given to him. He will announce and declare new things that are to come. That will happen in the future. The King James says he will show, S-H-E-W, show you things to come. The word show includes announcing things, as they said here in Amplified. But if you go back to the root of show, it means to reveal. The Holy Spirit will reveal to you things to come. He will help you by revealing things to you. Now, go down to the next paragraph in your notes. The spirit of truth, Ruach Emmet, is the spirit of wisdom and revelation Paul spoke of. He is here 
to guide us in all heavenly truth and ways of righteousness. God's righteous ways of knowing, thinking, being, and doing. Now, really quick, let's turn to Ephesians chapter 1 and Colossians chapter 1. Hold your place in Colossians. We're going to read Ephesians first. But let's do Ephesians 1 and Colossians 1, and we're going to read them back to back. And then we're going to close out. Ephesians 1 and Colossians 1. Have you ever taken a test, or you're, you're getting ready to take a test, and someone offers you a cheat sheet? I'm going to give you a cheat sheet. I'll sell it to you for $5. dollars uh, Cheat sheet for $5. Dollars. Okay? And it's got all the answers on it. You just follow the cheat sheet. I'm about to give you a cheat sheet for prayer. These two passages of Scripture are kind of like a cheat sheet for prayer because they're actual prayers. Prayers that Paul the Apostle prayed that we can pray. Ephesians 1, verse 15, in the King James. Wherefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, Cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Here's what he's praying. The next thing is the prayer. Verse 17. He prays that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, and what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? Do those words sound familiar to you? I basically pray that before I start preaching every Sunday. Don't. God taught me this prayer 20 some odd years ago. And God showed me, the Holy Spirit showed me, he said, son, if you will pray this prayer every single day before you sit down to read the word, he said, it will revolutionize your life. You will see things in the Word you never saw before. Things in the Word will pop out to you, and I will be able to show you things that you never thought would be available to you. Because this prayer is printed in the Bible for you, son. Well, guess what? It's printed for you, too. Because God no respect of persons. Right. So if you take this prayer, and you read this prayer, and you pray it, you pray it. You can, you're allowed to pray it verbatim, word for word. And you pray this prayer. And you pray, Father, Heavenly Father, I ask you to give to me the spirit of wisdom and revelation in your knowledge and enlighten the eyes of my understanding so that I understand your word. And you ask God for that and you read the word, guess what? You're going to get something out of it. Today is my day. Okay? Something's going to happen. Good going to happen to you because you're going to understand the word. And you're going to go, Golly! I never saw that before. Well, guess what? The Holy Spirit's answering your prayer. Amen. Amen? And you come into church and you hear things that you've never heard before, and the revelation of God hits you, and you're going, Wow, well, I never saw that before in the Bible. That's the spirit of wisdom and revelation working. Why? Because we prayed it before we prayed. Amen? Because it's a prayer in the Bible. If it's a prayer in the Bible, that's a cheat sheet. You can do that one, and it'll work every single time. Amen? Yeah. Now let's go to, to uh, Colossians. Colossians, chapter 1, verse 9, is where this prayer begins. We're going to read it out of the New Living Translation. It's smoother. So we have not stopped praying for you since we first heard about you. We ask God to give you complete knowledge of what? Say that again. God, give me knowledge of your will. Complete knowledge of his will and to give you spiritual wisdom and understanding. How can you go wrong praying that? 
God, I'm, I, I'm a Father, I'm asking you to give me complete knowledge of your will and spiritual wisdom and understanding with it. Again, God taught me this prayer, and he said, Son, pray them both before you read. Pray them both before you preach. Pray them both before you open the Word. Guess what? I ain't stopped. I pray these all the time. After 20 years, I'm still praying. Why? Because every time I pray them, the Holy Spirit opens the word up to me, and I'm like, wow, I never saw that before. And I never stop learning and discerning and having revelation. Amen. Because his word is good. And if you go on, you read it, there's so much good in there. The way you live will always honor God. It will please the Lord. Your lives will produce every kind of good fruit. All the while, you will grow. Everybody say grow. What are we doing? We're growing into what God wants us to grow into. We're maturing. As we learn to know God better and better. We also pray that you will be strengthened with all his glorious power. So you may have endurance and patience that you need. Boy, don't we need that. Amen. Hallelujah. And may you be filled with joy. Always thanking the Father. He has enabled you to share in the inheritance that belongs to his people. Who live in what? Say it again. Is the Holy Spirit the light of the Word of God? Yes, He is. Is He guiding us through His light? Yes, He is. The light of the Word, the light of the truth will guide us. These two prayers right here will set your prayer life on fire, will set your study life on fire, will change your life completely. You'll open up the Word, and you'll never be able to say again, I just don't understand it. Don't ever let those words come out of your mouth. Because the Holy Spirit is giving you two prayers for that never to happen again. Amen? Because it'll be on you instead of on God. All right? Now, if we look down, <coughs> we're going to end this. The last thing on your notes is, we're looking at the Spirit of Truth as our prayer guide. Now, he goes along through here in this scripture, and we studied this scripture last week. It's Romans 8, 26 through 28. The Holy Spirit comes to our aid and bears us up in our weakness. <coughs> Excuse me. For we do not know what to prayer to offer or how to offer it worthily as we ought. But the Spirit himself goes to meet our supplication and pleads in our behalf with unspeakable yearnings and groanings too deep for utterance. And he who searches the hearts of men knows what is in the mind of the Holy Spirit, what his intent is, because the Spirit intercedes and pleads before God in behalf of the saints according to and in harmony with what? God's will. Do you think the Holy Spirit could possibly pray, pray wrong at all? It's impossible. So when you partner with the Holy Spirit to pray, and you're praying according to the, in cooperation with the Holy Spirit, according to God's will, which is the two scriptures we have at the beginning of this, and you follow those two scriptures, the Holy Spirit is going to accompany you into the prayer room. He's going to accompany you all the way into the throne room. And when you come boldly before the throne of God, bringing His Word with you and your request, the Holy Spirit is going to be praying beside you, through you, and with you. Amen? And you're going to pray the right things. Read the paragraph next. The Spirit of truth, we're all given, searches the deepest recesses of our hearts. He knows and understands our what? We all have them. So he guides us into the truth of Abba's will pertaining to our desires, requests, and needs. He guides and accompanies us into the Holy of Holies. He prays with us unto the Father with spiritual expression impossible for the human tongue to articulate. He is speaking his language with his own groaning. Ruach Emma prays for us and with us as if our needs, desires, and requests were his very own. In the same way that Jesus paid the supreme penalty for our sins on the cross as if they were his own, Ruach Emma prays for our needs, desires, and requests as if they were his very own. Since God be for us, who could ever prevail? Amen? Amen? This is how to pray perfectly. And never have a prayer go unanswered. Amen? Everybody with me? Mm -hmm. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're praying in tongues. Because people have misunderstood this verse. I want to 
Because just before we close, I want to go back. I want you to understand what he's talking about. Okay? Go back to verse 26. It's on page 3, the bottom of page 3. The Holy Spirit comes to our aid and bears us up in our weakness. For we don't know what to pray or what prayer to offer or how to offer it worthily as we ought. But the Holy Spirit himself, everybody say himself. Yeah. He goes to meet our supplication and pleads in our behalf. He doesn't say he's pleading through us. This ain't praying in tongues. This is nothing to do with praying in tongues. He pleads on our behalf with what? Read it out loud. Unspeakable yearnings and groanings too deep for what? Utterance. What is utterance? Like what we're doing right, what I'm, I'm speaking. We can't say what he's saying. So it's not you speaking in tongues. If it was you speaking in tongues, it would be worded different. He's saying these are words the Holy Spirit speaking that are unutterable. We're not saying anything. He's the one talking. Everybody understand that? Mm -hmm. It ain't us praying in tongues. So what he's doing is, he is praying along with us. As we're praying in our English language to the Father, the Holy Spirit is praying beside us as our partner in his way, in his language. And he's praying with us as a partner on our behalf. And I dare say he's correcting some of the stuff we're getting wrong. Because he knows our weakness and he's helping us do it. Amen? So if we pray depending on the Holy Spirit and ask Him to pray with us, we'll never get it wrong. Amen? Amen. And if we have the wrong desire before we get there, He'll correct it before we go and show us what we need. Now, are y'all ready to pray? Yeah. Let's get to it. Prayer is this. It's written out for you to pray, pray with me all week long. 
Okay, at least through the end of the future. Heavenly Father, we ask that you will protect our elections from the strategies of the enemy. We ask that you make every legal vote be cast and counted. We ask that you remove from every government office every person who does not honor you and your word and who does not honor and uphold the constitutional values of our founding fathers. We ask that you will replace these individuals with folks who do love and honor you and your word and who will honor and uphold the constitutional values of our founding fathers. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Is that a prayer y'all would agree with? Amen. Okay. So, we're going to pray this before we take communion. Okay? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray, and I'd love for y'all to pray with me. So, Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. And we're asking you to intercede in our elections. We're asking you that you, Father, would take our elections and you would protect 